So we were introduced to the stories of the three messengers. And it goes like this. وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا أَصْحَابَ الْقَرِيَةِ إِذْ جَاءَهَا الْمُرْسَلُونَ إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمُ اثْنَيْنِ فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا فَعَزَّزْنَا بِسَالِسٍ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ قالوا ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا وما أنزل الرحمن من شيء إن أنتم إلا تكذبون قالوا ربنا يعلم إن إليكم لمرسلون وما علينا إلا البلاغ المبين That's our message our responsibility is to deliver the message قالوا إن تطيرنا بكم That's where we start So what was the response of the people of the town? The response of the disbelievers is, you know, you guys are bad omen. I mean, some people, uh, they see a bad dream and it ruins their whole day. Some people hear something and it ruins their, their mood and their whole day. These guys are like this. This is verse 18 in Surah Yunus. They said, we believe you the cause of the ill luck befalling us. So they said, truly, we augur ill of you. You are a sign of a bad omen. You are a sign of bad things to happen. You seem to be a bad sign. We're going to have a bad day. We're going to have a bad time. So this superstitious ideas of, of thinking that something could be a bad omen is not something specific to a particular community. It, it used to exist across all communities. Uh, Arabs and non-Arabs. Here the story is taking place in the Byzantian Empire and the dwellers of the town happen to also be of those people who hold these beliefs. The Arabs used to have the same thing. The, the, the Arab in Mecca or in Arabia before Islam, in the morning they used to leave their house. And if they see a bird, there are many birds in the Arabian Peninsula, if they see a bird flying to the, to the left, to their left, they say, oh, today is going to be a bad day. They go back home and they stay home. And if they see a bird flying to their right, they say, oh, today is a good day. I'm going to have good business. And then they, call, they go on and conducting their day in a normal way. So these Byzantian people, they're the same. It shows that human nature is one. Human nature is one. They said, we see ill omen. Or foretell a punishment that will befall you. So they said, Truly will we augur ill of you. You are a carrier of a sign of bad things to happen to us. So what was the reaction? The reaction is, If you cease not, the reaction is pretty violent. Right? It says, stop. And if you cease not, we shall certainly stone you. And a painful punishment will certainly befall you from us. That was the reaction. The reaction is not a reaction of, let's have a dialogue. No, the reaction is either my way or we're going to stone you and kill you. What was the response of the three apostles or the three messengers? 
they said qalu ta'irukum ma'akum ta'irukum ma'akum they said your ill luck is but from yourselves qalu ta'irukum ma'akum if anything bad is going to happen to you it's because of your own deeds and you are the reasons you are the causes behind these bad things and if anything good is going to happen to you it's because of the choices and the you are basically the reasons for these good things you are the source you are the origin you are the root of these things as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in surah al-isra verse 13 Says, وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنُقِهِ This idea of a ta'ir in your neck. قَالُوا إِنَّا تَطَيَّرْنَا بِكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And every man, the works that take wings from him, like your work, your, de- your deeds, they like wings for you. They either take you high or they take you low. And every man, the works that take wings from him to augur good or ill, we have bound responsibility for them to his own neck. And on resurrection day, we shall bring out for him a record he shall find spread open. So if anything bad happens to us, it's our own fault. If anything good happens to us, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated good for us. And through the asbab, through the means, we achieve these good things. So they're telling them, like, your bad omen is stuck to your neck as a result of your own actions. You are the one responsible for these bad things that will happen to you. And that's what the messengers told the disbeliever. They says, Ta'irukum ma'akum. It's from you. And it's with you, this bad omen. A'in zukkirtum. A'in zukkirtum. They said, your ill luck is but from yourselves. Well, what? All this merely because you have been admonished, like this huge reaction, this violent reaction, is only because you've been admonished. Rather, you are a people who exceed all bounds. بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ The structure of the ayah says, أَإِنْ ذُكِّرْتُمْ أَإِنْ ذُكِّرْتُمْ It's a question. But it's not a real question. It's a rhetorical question. It's a question that we will, that the ulama of Arabic will say, this is istifhamun inkari. It's a scolding question. So usually when you ask a question, there is an answer to the question. Where is the answer to this question? The answer to the question is not mentioned. Where is the answer to a'in zukkirtum? I.e., because we are admonishing you and reminding you, we became the source of the bad things that may befall you. What kind of logic is this? And as a result of this, you're threatening to kill us. They're trying to reason with them. So the answer to the question is omitted. بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ That's the judgment. I.e. مُسْرِفُونَ أَنْتُمْ مُغَالُونَ فِي التَّصَوْرِ You exceed all bounds. You, you have misconceptions. You have misunderstandings. And in you are, you have deviated from the, uh, the way of the truth. That's where your israf comes in. Your israf is that you've gone to one extreme the extreme of misconception, misunderstanding, and deviating from the truth, or from the uh, sirat, from al-manhaj al-qawim. قَالُوا طَائِرُكُمْ مَعَكُمْ أَإِنْ ذُكِّرْتُمْ بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ بَلْ أَنْتُمْ قَوْمٌ مُسْرِفُونَ 
So this is the first chapter. The second chapter begins with this person coming from far. And it spans about eight ayahs, from verse 20 to verse 27. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى And from the farthest edge of the city, a man came in haste from the outskirts of the city. A man came running, came inside. He said, my people, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ My people, follow the messengers. My people, faithfully, follow the messengers. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ يَسْعَى i.e. he is running, he is coming in haste. He is, he is, he doesn't waste time. It's an indication that he is very interested. And, and it's an indication because he came from the farthest, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ From the furthest point of town. It means this person had become Muslim and believed in the messengers. And he was on the outskirts of town from the farthest edge of the town. But, he wanted to know what happened with the, with the messengers. He wanted to know what's, what was going to take place between the messengers and the disbelievers. And the disbelievers are his people. Are his people. His own people. How do we know it's his own people? He says, Ya qawmi. Qala ya qawmi. Oh, my people. He is from them and they are from him. Qala ya qawmi. Tabi'ul mursali. Now, so he came running in order to participate in this discussion, in this conversation, in this dialogue. He says, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ Ya قَوْمِ This is an indicator that he is from the same city. He is not a stranger. He is not a foreigner. He is from them. They know him. And وَجَاءَ رَجُلٌ This tankir, uh, it's indefinite, it's left indefinite, to indicate that this man has some kind of position, or he is a man of consequence. He is a man that uh, they know him. They know of him. And that's why he is able to engage the leaders of the community, the leaders among the disbelievers. He said, follow the messengers. And he called them messengers. He called them messengers. Indicating that he believes in them. He hasn't professed publicly yet that he is a believer. But he's hinting. We will see now in his discussion with the disbelievers, this man seems to be clever. And he is, he is making da'wah in a very clever way. And he is arguing with them and presenting an argument and building a case. He said, اتبعوا المرسلين i.e. he is believing in them and he is hinting that they're not liars. These guys are not liars because before they said ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا you like us so you must be liars. Messengers and prophets cannot be like us. And he's hinting also that they have no agenda. They have no nothing to gain behind, uh, you know, telling you or delivering the message. They have no personal interest behind delivering the message. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ This means that number one, he is already a believer. Number two, that he made a decision. And that he is not going to keep silent. 
And this decision is not an emotional decision. It's an intellectual decision. He thought about it, said, I cannot stay silent. I have to stand by the truth. And he made a decision that he will support the messengers. And he also, because he, as soon as this conversation took place, he came running. It means he is paying attention. Although he is in the farthest edge of the city, he has people that can tell him what's going on. And he found out very quickly that this is happening in the center of town. So he is aware of what the messengers are doing. He is aware, or he kept himself aware of what his people are doing, because he knows his people. He knows his people are violent people. He knows his people, they're disbelievers, and if you're going to threaten their idols or whatever they believe in, they're not going to be, to let it go. And also, his rushing to participate in this conversation shows us that he is remorseful for his previous life. Because in his previous life, he might have been like his people, like the disbelievers. But since he became a believer, he felt regret for his previous life, and he says, I cannot continue like this. And I cannot keep silent. I have to support the truth. I have to support these messengers. And then he says, اتبعوا. Now he's reasoning. Why should we follow them? اتبعوا من لا يسألكم أجرا وهم مهتدون. He says, follow those who ask you no wage. Follow those who ask nothing of you. Who don't ask for any reward. Even the slightest reward. And who are well guided. So now he's presenting an argument to the people. He's talking to his people, but he's also talking to the audience. Because if you can imagine what used to take place in, in uh, pre-modern times, uh, the community is not very large. And something happening in the center of town, so people gather and they want to know what's going on, and they're watching, and they're observing. And they're seeing this live dialogue between the leaders and the messengers. So he's saying, well, if you want to prove that these guys are truthful, I'm going to give you two proofs. I'm going to give you two reasons why you should follow them. The first reason is, look, well, if they have a personal agenda, if they have an ulterior motive behind their message, don't follow them. Don't follow them. If they're looking for, for money, don't follow them. If they're looking for fame, don't follow them. If they're looking for reputation, don't follow them. If they're looking to become your leaders and replace you, don't look, don't follow them. Because they have ulterior motives. And, and they become suspect, then you're correct. You should, you, should, you should be suspicious of them. And this could be an indication that they're lying. You're right. All my people, you may be right. But the opposite is also true. If you find out they're not asking anything from you, they're not asking for reward, they're not asking for monetary reward, they're not asking for fame or reputation or positions or to become leaders. This also could be an indication that they're truthful, that they're not lying. They're just on a mission, they're delivering the message, and then they're gonna walk away to the next town. And this idea that is mentioned in the Quran over 10 times. 
in Surah Al-Shu'ara, it's mentioned five times. On the tongue of Shu'aib, on the tongue of Lut, on the tongue of Salih, on the tongue of Hud, on the tongue of Nuh, it's mentioned all the time. I ask not of you any reward for it. قُلْ مَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرَى قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرَى قُلْ مَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرَى قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرَى Keeps repeating, keeps repeating. And then in Surah, uh, in Surah Saad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the tongue of Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam, قُلْ مَا سَأَلْتُكُمْ مِنْ أَجْرٍ فَهُوَ لَكُمْ And this ma is either it's a, ma, it's a conditional ma or a relative ma, uh, a relative pronoun. Uh, the point here is that uh, the idea, the mere idea that messengers ask anything of the people is negated. Is negated. That's the first proof. He said that's the first reason you should believe in them. Like, Look at them, they're not asking for anything. They just wish something good for you. The second reason, وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ Sometimes you can tell whether a person is lying or not by looking at them. Are they living up to the same standards they're inviting to, inviting you to, uh, you know, to follow? Are they upholding the same standards? Are they themselves mustaqim? If they're mustaqim, if they're upright people and they're inviting you to be upright, yeah. Their example, uh, their behavior is a testimony, is, 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 is testifies to, their, to the truthfulness of their claim. If you see them that they're muhtadun, if you see them that they have good character, if they see that they have good traits, if they see that they have istiqama, if, they, if you see that you know, they're truthful, they're sadiq, they're amin, then I know that, that it's not inconceivable that their words are true. And it's likely that they're telling the truth. They're not lying. Because they're practicing what they're preaching. قال وجاء من أقصى المدينة رجل يسعى قال يا قوم اتبعوا المرسلين I'm going to give you two examples two reasons why you should follow them اتبعوا من لا يسألكم أجرا وهم مهتدون and then he changed he changes style instead of talking to the people or the audience or the leaders, or the disbelievers, he starts talking to himself. He says, That's, This style is not threatening. It's more like, it's more like a neutral style. He's talking to himself. He's talking about himself. Usually when somebody is criticizing me, I may feel upset. But the person is criticizing himself. Why should I feel upset? He says, وَمَا لِيَ لَا أَعْبُدُ الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ He's talking to himself now. He says, am I crazy? Am I crazy? How could I not worship the one who has originated me? This is now another argument that is presented to them in a very neutral way and not threatening way. He says, am I crazy not to worship the one who created me from and brought me from non-existence into existence? Am I that crazy? i.e. what he's telling them, what I wish for myself, I wish for yourself, for, the, for you. وَمَا لِيَ لَا أَعْبُدُ أَلَّذِي فَطَرَنِي أَلَّذِي فَطَرَنِي 
how could I not worship the one who has originated me? And he kept Allazi ambiguous. Allazi fataran. Whoever fataran. So, if you think that our idols, your idols, are the one that originated us, I'm going to worship them. I'm going to worship whoever fatarani. Am I crazy not to worship the one who fatarani? Not to worship the one who originated me? Am I crazy? Am I crazy not to show gratitude to the one who brought me from non-existence into existence? Well, if you think the idols are the one or the sun or the moon, whatever they're worshiping, beside our Rahman, they believe in the Rahman, but they also have other aliha, other gods. He said, well, prove to me, show me that they're the one who created us, and I will worship them. I will worship them. The point here, I'm going to worship the one who created me. If the idols create me, I'll agree with you and I'll worship them. So, show me, tell me, who created me? It's like there is a question, embedded a question to the disbelievers. Show me who created me and I will, I will worship him. If the idols are the one that created me, then, you know, you're right, you're correct. You should not listen to these to these messengers, and we should worship the idols. But we know that you know, and we know, and he's telling them, you know, and I know, that the idols cannot even bring themselves into existence. Then how could I not worship the one, the creator, who has brought me into existence? Why should I not worship him? Who originated me? How could I not worship? And that's the first commandment. What's the first commandment in the Quran? The first commandment in the Quran is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. That's the first commandment. When we read Surah Al-Baqarah, we read like almost 20 ayahs before we encounter the first command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the first commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressed to all of humanity. It says, Ya ayyuhan nasu, abudu rabbakum. It says, O mankind, worship your Lord. Why? Allazi khalaqakum. Who created you? So, uh, according to the ulama of aqidah and tawheed, they say, the attribute of power and creation is the most specific attribute of a deity, of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَفَمَنْ يَخْلُقْ كَمَنْ لَا يَخْلُقْ It's a khassu wasfin. The most specific attribute. The most specific quality. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ عَبُدُوا رَبَّكُمْ أَلَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ not only you, وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O mankind, worship our Lord, worship your Lord, who created you, all of you, and all those before you, that happily you might be God-fearing, that happily you might achieve taqwa. And then in the following verse came the first prohibition. In verse number 22 in Surah Al-Baqarah, it says, وَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ So give not rivals to Allah while you know. The first commandment and the first prohibition. The first commandment is worship Allah. Why? Because He created you. أَلَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ The same thing is saying here. He says, وَمَا لِيَ لَا أَعْبُدُ الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي فَطَرَنِي in a way that when I'm born, I'm born in a clean slate. I'm born in a state of fitra, in a state of innate nature. And 
وإليه ترجعون And to him shall you be returned. If you're going to return to the idols, yeah, I'm going to follow the idols. But the idols will perish like everything else. And then he says, وما لي لا أعبد الذي فطرني وإليه ترجعون أأتخذ من دونه آلهة إن يردني الرحمن بضر لا تغني عني شفاعتهم شيئا ولا ينقذون That's another argument He is reasoning with them in a very logical and systematic way He says you want me not to believe in this creator who created me and created all of us and brought us from non-existence into existence. So the question is, shall I take gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worship them and leave the worship of the one who is worthy of worship? Is that what you want? Is that what you want? You want me to forsake Allah and worship Forsake Allah, the one who created me and brought me into this world and leave him and believe in other gods? Is that what you want? Okay, I'm going to do that. Let's say for the sake of argument, I do that. Let's say I believe in other gods. So then he presents to them what-if scenarios. So what if, what if I fall sick? What if some misfortune, you know, befell, befalls me? Are they going to help me? Are these idols going to help me? Are these idols going to cure me? Are these idols going to heal me? Are, they, are these idols going to support me? If they're going to heal me and support me and, and help me, I'm going to worship them. You're correct, you're right. We should not follow the messengers. He said, أَأَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِهِ آلِهَةً إِنْ يُرِدْنِ الرَّحْمَنُ بِضُرٍ لَا تُغْنِ عَنِّي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا وَلَا يُنْقِذُونَ He says, should I take short of him pathetic godlings? If the all-merciful intended any affliction for me, their intercession would avail me nothing. They can't help. They can't cure me. They can't heal me. They can't do anything. Nor could they save me. وَلَا يُنْقِذُونَ So you want me not to follow the one who is nafi' dar and to follow these idols? You want me not to follow the one that benefits and harms? Under his control, all benefits and all harms. And you want me to follow those idols? So let's say I leave God and I don't worship him and I start worshiping these idols. So tomorrow when I fall sick, are they going to heal me? If I, if my business goes, you know, goes down, um, are they going to bring back my business to life? If some affliction is to happen to me, are they going to assist me? If they're not, then I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Why should I be crazy and follow those who don't benefit or harm and leave the one who benefits and harm and leave the one who created me from nothing? Are you out of your mind? I'm not out of my mind, he's telling them. You want me to be out of my mind? And then when I look at these idols, they're like me. That's what you told them. ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا. I'm gonna tell you the same. These idols are like me. They're مخلوقات. They're created being, created things like we're created things. Why should I follow them? So that's the question. The question: أأتخذوا أأتخذوا هذا استفهام إنكاري. أأتخذوا من دونه like I cannot believe what you're asking me to do. This type of questioning is a scolding question. It's a it's a question intended to rebuke. 
and actually it has a three uh, uh, more than three uh, embedded uh, connotations within the question uh, usually it shows their limitations it shows their limitations it's like in Surah Al-Nabi, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ This is Istifam al -Inkar. It shows their limitations. It also shows their misconceptions, if they have misconceptions. It shows also their lies, if they're lying. Etc., etc., etc. It's a rhetorical question. I'm not, ask, I'm not expecting an answer. Then he says, Inni izan lafi mubin. If I were to do this, I'm indeed crazy. I'm indeed in a manifest error. I'm indeed has gone plainly astray. Verily then, I would be lost plainly astray. If I were to follow what, you, what you're doing and worship these, these idols. Today, you know, the idols appear in different forms. They appear in the form of money, they appear in the form of fame, they appear in the form... Some people worship paper documents, some people worship system and process. To be honest, he's telling them, to be honest, I'm crazy then. If you if you ask me to do what you're asking me to do, tell you the truth, I'm not in my right mind. After I've come to the conclusion that your gods did not create me, your little idols cannot benefit me or harm me, and that the true creator, Ar-Rahman, which you believe in him, if he were to afflict any, if he were to um, um, bring any affliction um, to me or to anyone, None of these idols will be able to help me. And even though you want me to leave him, no, I'm inni izan lafi dalalin mubin. I'm in manifest error. Then. I'm crazy. I'm, I'm not worthy of anything. This is this is an slew. This is a style, a style of argumentation that you know you want to present a message to someone who doesn't want to hear it you do it in a way uh, that they don't feel attacked in a neutral way you talk to yourself Now, after he finished building his case, after he finished presenting his case, he gave the punchline, i.e. he gave the natija, he gave the decision. He made the decision. He said, going through all this, this led me to a decision. And this decision, in, uh, he says, Inni amantu bi rabbikum fasma'u. That's the decision he made. After he presented his logical argument or his case and presented his arguments, his arguments led to this conclusion. The conclusion is, I must believe in this, in this God. I must believe in Allah. Inni amantu bi rabbikum. Fasma'oon. Fasma'oon. He said, verily, I have believed in the Lord of all of you. Bi rabbikum. Fasma'oon. So hear me well. Hear my testimony and hear my admission. Now, you can imagine the reaction of the disbelievers. Like their blood is boiling hearing all this. Uh, what was their reaction? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't even mention their reaction. He says, Inni amantu bi rabbikum fasma'oon. And immediately the scene changes. So it's up to us now to fill the blanks. 
what was the result of the dialogue between this person and his, his people? And what was their reaction? It was said to him, It was said unto him, Enter the garden, enter paradise. He replied, So now we know what happened to him. We know what happened to him. He met his fate. So after his declaration to the people, because now he's addressing the disbelievers, he's also addressing the audience. So now the leaders are losing ground. Some of the audience may, may say, well, this makes sense. This is common sense. Why should we follow the idols? Why not follow these messengers who have you know, good character and they're not asking for anything except for delivering the message? So they lost the argument. Disbelievers lost the argument. And the people around them, some of them seem to be convinced. And before they told him, you know, we're going to stone you or we're going to kill you like in, a, in a horrible way. And that's what they did. And Fasirun said they killed him in a horrible way. Uh, and they stoned him. The man was stoned and killed. And we understand this from the ayah. It was says to him, enter paradise. I.e. is telling us the end of this man. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, فَقَتَلُوهُ فَقِيلَ لَهُ دْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ Did not say, so they killed him and then we told him, enter paradise. The Quran tells us, or if we were present at that time, we would be able to witness and observe what happened up until the moment he was killed. As to what happened to him after he was killed, we have no access to we have no access to that. Who knows? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then Allah informed us, Qila. This is something we don't have access to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through revelation is informing us. Qila, i.e. to him. Idkhul al-jannah. Enter paradise. In the story of Ashab al qarya there are many points of our belief that are present in the story. One of the point is This is an indication that Jannah is in existence today. Jannah has already been created. It's not something that will be created after the end of the world. I.e. it was created before the end of the world. Perhaps someone might say, well, this maybe he was told to enter paradise on the day of judgment, maybe not now. Well, if that was true, then the ayah would not say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have said, Law kana This man would not have said, Law kana So the ayah says, uh, he said, would that my people knew? Because on the day of judgment, they're all gathered in Ardul Mahshar, and they all know that they're going to be paradise and hellfire. Now it's said to him now in this life. It was said to him after being killed right away. Right away. That's point number one. Point number two, we know that None of us will enter paradise except on the Day of Judgment. So the ulama of Tafsir tells us that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels showed him his place in paradise. 
as indicated in the teachings of the Prophet والسلام, that the Prophet says or Allah tells us on the tongue of the Prophet وسلم, and then it will be said to someone who dies this could have been your seat in hellfire God has replaced that seat with a seat in paradise for you so in the grave a person is seeing what his end is going to be and that's naim that's pure pleasure he's seeing in anticipation his seat in paradise so if all of us, inshallah, if our end is good, then we will benefit from this until the day of judgment. Secondly, entering paradise is by body and soul. It's not by the soul only. Because when we die, our soul separates from our body. And the body disintegrates and the soul is returns to the Lord. So on the day of judgment, entering paradise is not in this world, is not by the soul only. Entering paradise is by body and soul, together. And that takes place on the day of judgment. Some philosophers used to think that Naim al Jannah Ruhani, that uh, the pleasure of paradise is only the soul, the body, uh, has no place there. And some people in other religions also think the same. That's point number two. Point number three, that's قِيلَ دْخُلِ This is also a point in Aqidah and our belief that death is not nothingness. الْمَوْتُ لَيْسَ عَدَمًا we should not think that when a person dies, he perishes completely to the point of non-existence. No. Death is, is a transition, is to transition from one life onto the next. That's it. Different life. Life of Barzakh. So, life is when the soul enters the body. Death is when the soul separates from the body. But it's not nothingness. So these points of Aqaid are mentioned in the Surah, they're like veins, and they strengthen our Iman, and they clarify things for us. That's the benefit of knowledge, that when we learn something, if we have misconceptions or misunderstandings, it gets clarified, they get clarified. What was his reply? What was his reply? His immediate reply says, If only my people could know. If only my people could know. He's wishing that if, if there is a way to send an email or to send a fax or to send a WhatsApp message from the hereafter to this life just to tell his people, look, don't you know don't make this mistake you know there is something great awaiting you if he could just communicate from behind uh, from the, this new life and communicate to his people in the in the current life in the dunya maybe we can have a zoom zoom meeting huh, between قال يا ليت قومي يعلمون قال يا ليت قومي يعلمون يعلمون what he said if only my people could know know what he says بما غفر لي ربي وجعلني من المكرمين the first thing he mentioned he says of my lords if only my people could know could know of what of my lords forgiving me and making me of the loftiest in honor. 
وجعلني من المكرمين from the loftiest. This is the last verse for today. He did not say, if only my people could know of what my Lord rewarded me. He said, no, of my Lord forgiving me. Forgiving me. He focused on forgiveness rather than reward. It seems that he is remembering his sayyat prior to becoming Muslim. Because as soon as he became Muslim, after a short time, قيل له ادخل الجنة. It's like he's saying, I was nothing. I was nothing. I was not worthy of any of this. And, and there is an embedded message to, it's like he's telling his people or telling those that will read the Quran that don't worry, Allah forgives all sins. Allah forgives all sins. If you're worried about your sins, Allah forgives all sins. If one comes with the right attitude, and, and this person has a repentance that has washed away all his sins. So he remembered the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of the reward that he is he's seeing. So lastly, we'll finish with this point. قيل ادخل الجنة قال يا ليت قومي يعلمون بما غفر لي ربي وجعلني من المكرمين. How was he killed? He was killed in a horrible way. Imagine yourself being tortured and oppressed in the most horrible way. What would you think of your oppressors? You would hate them to death. You would say, I seek vengeance and revenge against them. That's not his attitude. His attitude, and this is an indication, or that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be, is that a believer does not hold any grudge in his heart. And it's not easy. The opposite, he was, he felt very sorry for them. He says, When he saw this paradise and this naim and this pleasure, the first thing he remembered is his people. Hmm? So the message here is that a Muslim, a believer, does not have in his heart or her heart an envy or hatred toward anyone, neither Muslim nor otherwise. Then what do we have in our heart? In our heart we have, we hold and we carry nasiha. We carry like the messengers. We carry tazkir, reminders. We carry tahzir, warning. We carry bayan, explication. We carry commandments and prohibitions, awamir and nawahi. We deliver the message to the best of our ability. And people react in different ways. That's their issue. That's their issue. Like, imagine you know, someone who's a shrink, and a patient comes to a shrink, and the patient starts jumping up and down in front of the shrink, and the shrink is looking at the patient going up and down. Would he get angry or mad? No, because the person is sick. And peoples who don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have a spiritual disease that needs to be cured. So one should not have, should not hold any grudge toward anyone. But rather, you know, be like the shrink or be like the messenger. Make an attempt to, uh, to cure them. Uh, so this actually finishes or ends the story of Ashabul Qariya. It's a very short story, a very powerful message. And it's telling us you know, how to present a message, how to build our argument, how to talk with people. We need to understand people. What's some people are very sensitive to hear one thing. And then you can switch your style to talk about yourself rather than them. But in all of this, he is wishing the best for them. Even though they killed him, you know, uh, by stoning and they you know, separated his organs and so on and so forth. 
Are there any questions or comments? Does the story make sense? No. Yeah, totally. Uh, how does uh, the Nakira of Rajuloi, I mean, actually at Rage, but how does the uh, Nakira make it so that he has a position in his club? Oh, Nakira in, in Arabic is, uh, you know, any word that we use in writing, um, the choice we make indicates a certain benefit. So if I choose to use a definite article, uh, I'm doing it for a reason. If I choose an indefinite article, I'm doing it for a reason. So, so sometimes nakira, in indefinite, is used for ta'zim. Sometimes it's used for tafkhin. Sometimes it's used, like for example, in the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, where he once he was sitting with his companions and he told them he asked them a question Inna min ash-shajari shajaratan la yasqutu waraquha wa innaha mathalul muslim he said among the trees there is a tree a tree shajaratan is nakira so he left it nakira here to indicate that it is a select tree, it's a special tree. So whenever, if you use a nakira and indefinite, there must be a fa'ida balaghiya, there must be a rhetorical benefit behind the word. So, so it could be that this man has a position, or a person of consequence, or a person known to them, because he's able to talk to them and have a dialogue. And we understood this from the nakira. Sometimes the nakira is just is there to belittle something. Sometimes it's there to leave it ambiguous. Sometimes it's there to to make ta'zim or tafkhim. Uh, yeah. Jazakallah. Good questions, yeah. Tadal. story inside what's the question totally so the first uh, 11 ayahs focused on the on prophetology, on the message, uh, on Risala, the messengership of the Prophet What is the essence of the messengership? Tahzir and bayan and delivering a message, and delivering a message. But the focus on the role of the messenger as a messenger came in the 11th ayah, there was a focus and emphasis on resurrection. So in the 12th ayah, it talks about resurrection. And now, immediately after that, a story is presented to convey the same thing, that there are messengers that will deliver a message and remind people of the hereafter and remind people to follow them. He is not like alone or an isolated case. And there are people from amongst the disbelievers who will believe in that message. And they're willing to sacrifice anything, even their own life. And to tell the truth in front of those who, who may hate hearing the truth the most. So this story now is inserted and it talks about the hereafter, what happens in the hereafter. I know a person 
he wrote the letter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wrote the letter. <laughs> he composed the letter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like a one page letter. I saw it. And uh, and then a few days later he saw a dream. And in the dream he says, He he thought that this could be an answer to the letter he wrote to Allah. He wrote in the letter, if I remember correctly, Oh Allah, I'm a weak servant, I'm kaza, I'm kaza, I'm kaza. He presented his case before Allah, and then he asked him certain things. Like usually, we make dua, he put it in writing. And he says, رسالة من العبد الفقير الحقير إلى رب العالمين إلى آخره. It's like when you write a letter to a friend of yours. Yeah. So here, in Surah Yasin, we have these three ideas, like coming together all the time. The Rasul, his message reminding people of the hereafter resurrection. That's why we read Yasin on those who are dying. Good. And also uh, the proofs and the arguments that talk about Allah's existence. Tawheed. Tawheed. And we will see now in the next ayat, we'll shift from Risala and resurrection to proofs of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what you said is true. But yeah, there is this aspect of it. No, he's not That's a bit far-fetched. There is no indication that he's a prophet. According to the Mufassirin, only the three, three of them were prophets. And this one was a follower because he used to worship idols. But he's, he used to be a man of profession. They used to say he's Najjar. Some people say he used to carve the idols in his previous life. He was Nahat. Hmm? Uh, but regardless of uh, the, the, the point of the story is that there are people who will respond to the message. And if, and they can, they can stand by the truth and declare that truth in support of messengers, in support of messengers, inviting people to believe in the message. The Prophet ﷺ may not need someone like this. But stories are there usually, stories uh, make the hearts firm. There is a possibility that could refer to the Prophet. Now we're going to move now into a different topic. So there are three topics. And then there will be an intermission. And then the second half of the surah, there is some kind of parallel to the first half. So we'll close the loop at the end. Any other comment or question, objection? Put the question.
whether it's the Holy Ghost who lives on the inside. And and this person who is on the outskirts, and again, that keeps coming up, he rushes, he, he rushes almost to knowing what his people are going to do. Mm. He knows he his people. <laughs> Yeah, he could have chosen safety. Yeah. So I'm wondering if is that the, the reason we, you know, again, from the outskirts we rush, you know, rush over. We don't just let that that mm. influence uh, uh, the fact that he knew he was going to put himself in harm's way. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, so what's? Uh, I'm just. I'm, I'm just. I was just. Trying great, to yeah. That. Yeah. Just, just trying to synthesize what you what you mentioned. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. With wisdom, with wisdom. In principle, yes. But then every situation requires wisdom. And he tried to be as wise as he could, but he had to take a position. He had to take a position. We need to learn wisdom. Now, something. Only in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In Shah Allah, Allah Majmana Alaik, or Fogak Nalik, Walla Tajal Hawa Ijana Illa Ilaik, Allah Homa La to Fogak Shamana as a Illa Bizam in Mafu, Wamal in Mabu, Watijara in Lentabu, Allah Homa Dabir Lana Amrana Kullahu, Bilutfika, Faina, Lana Sinu Tadbir. وردنا ورضى عنا اللهم إنك عفو كريم حليم تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم تقبل منا صلاتنا وصيامنا وقيامنا واجعلنا من عبادك المقبولين وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي الطيب الطاهر الزكي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم جزاكم الله خيرا